Hi boys and girls, Mrs. Blackburn here. I have a Fountas and Pinnell book called Song of the Water Boatman and Other Pond Poems. It was written by Joyce Seidman and illustrated by Becky Pranch. You can see we have a nice table of contents here in the beginning with all the long list of poetry that we'll be reading today. Glossaries in the back. Beautiful illustrations here. Looks like the setting is on a pond. The first poem begins with, Listen for me. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me on a still night, for in the night I sing, that is when my heart thaws, my skin thaws, my hunger thaws. That is when the world thaws and the air begins to ring. I creep up from the cold pond, the ice pond, the winter pond. I creep up from the chill pond to breathe the warming air. I cling to the green reeds, the damp reeds, the muddy reeds. I cling to the slim reeds, my brothers are everywhere. My throat swells with spring love, with rain love, with water love. My throat swells with peeper love. My song is high and sweet. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me tonight, tonight, and I'll sing you to sleep. Spring peepers. There's some information here at the top. It says the sound of spring peepers is one of the earliest signs of spring. These inch long tree frogs can freeze almost completely in winter because of a special antifreeze in their cells. As soon as the ground thaws, they begin to come alive again, climbing up twigs and bushes with their sticky toes. Their nighttime song, a loud steady trill, is actually a series of high pitched peeps lasting only a third of a second from their balloon like throat sacs the peepers you hear are the males who are calling to attract a mate. Hmm. So I'll show you the illustrations here. So you can take a look. I'm going to read it again. And this time when I read it, I want you to listen for how the author describes the peepers world. And I wonder what the author means when she says, my throat swells with spring love. Okay, I'm gonna read it again. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me on a still night, for in the night I sing. That is when my heart thaws, my skin thaws, my hunger thaws. That is when the world thaws and the air begins to ring. I creep up from the cold pond, the ice pond, the winter pond. I creep up from the chill pond to breathe the warming air. I cling to the green reeds, the damp reeds, the muddy reeds. I cling to the slim reeds. My brothers are everywhere. My throat swells with spring love, with rain love, with water love. My throat swells with peeper love. My song is high and sweet. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me tonight, tonight, and I'll sing you to sleep. So if we go back to that question about what the author means when she says, my throat swells with spring love. If you were wondering if maybe it was a mating call, you were right, very good. Okay, the next one's called spring splashdown. Peck, peck, crackle, crackle, fluff, fluff. Wiggle, wiggle, snooze, snooze. Mommy calling, peep, peep, scramble, scramble. Hop, hop, teeter, teeter, peek, peek. Water sparkling, deep breath, leaping, leaping. Splash down, bobbing, bobbing. Heads up, paddle, paddle, mom near, follow, follow. That was fun to read. So here's some information on the wood duck. The mother wood duck 
Duck's favorite place to nest is a tree cavity, as high as 50 feet in the air. When her eggs hatch, she warms and dries the duckling for a day or so. Then she flies down to the water and calls to them. They return her calls and move toward the nest hollow. Although they cannot yet fly, they leap one by one from the nest without hesitation. Hmm. Whether they land in the water or on the ground, they are almost always unharmed. The wood duck was once hunted nearly to extinction for its feathers. Strict hunting laws and the use of artificial nest sites have brought back the wood duck, but it remains a shy bird that prefers undisturbed ponds and wetlands. So, this page tells about peepers too. How is it different from the first one that we read about peepers? Here's the illustration. So this one obviously is about ducks, correct? Now when the author, when I was reading this, immediately I knew it was about ducks without looking at the illustration. How did I know that? Hmm. Well, as I was reading, the author was using words like peck peck, wiggle wiggle, fluff fluff. The author was using figurative language. Do you remember what kind of figurative language that is? You're right, it's onomatopoeia. Another fun word to say, onomatopoeia. Okay, so now that we know about the wood duck, we know those facts that the author gave us, um, I'm going to read the poem again and see if it has some different meaning for you now that we know some things, some facts about the wood duck. Spring splashdown, peck peck, crackle crackle, fluff fluff, wiggle wiggle, snooze snooze, mommy calling, peep peep, scramble scramble, hop hop, teeter teeter, peck peck, peek peek, water sparkling, deep breath, leaping, leaping, Splash down, bobbing, bobbing, heads up, paddle, paddle, mom near, follow, follow. So right here where it says, leaping, leaping, we know that the wood duck's nest is what? 50 feet in the air. So when mom calls, the poem's written leaping, leaping. They're, call they're jumping down into the water to where mom is and to follow. So that's fun how the poem is written that way. Do you ever think about writing a poem that way? You can. Next one is going to give us some information about the creature before we read the poem. This one's called Predaceous Diving Beetle. Diving beetles are sometimes called water tigers because they are such fierce underwater hunters. Although they are only an inch and a half long, they eat almost anything that moves and will attack much larger creatures with their powerful chewing mouth parts. Expert swimmers, they kick through the water with large back legs and can carry bubbles of air to breathe underwater. Smooth, hard wing cases streamline their bodies and also protect their delicate wings. They fly mostly at night to scout out new sources of food. Diving beetles food sharing rules. So now that we know facts about the beetle, diving beetles, let's read the poem. Any type of larva is mine, as well as all tadpoles, minnows, and newts. Sticklebacks, catus flies, spiders, and small frogs of any kind, mine. Snails, eggs, and bugs, all mine. In short, if it moves, it is mine. If it's anywhere near me, it is mine. If I'm hungry, and I'm always hungry, it is mine, mine, mine. And if, by chance, I choose to crawl up yonder smart weed, bask for a bit, open my armored wings, and fly about my kingdom, within which everything is mine. Do not forget what is mine, for if I returned and you have taken it, you are mine. I like how the author uses repetition there to get the point across. 
What is that word that she repeats? Mine. Okay, fly, dragonfly. I like dragonflies. Water nymph, you have climbed from the shallows to don your dragon colors. Perched on a red on a reed stem, all night shedding skin, you dry your wings in moonlight. Night melts into day. Swift birds wait to snap you up. Fly, dragonfly. Fly. Okay, so here's some information. The green darner. The green darner is one of almost 5,000 species of dragonflies. Its huge eyes allow it to see in all directions and its four wings move separately. All dragonflies are amazing flyers able to zoom up to 35 miles per hour, stop short, hover, and even fly backward. They spend several months or years living underwater as nymphs. Then, one warm spring night, the nymphs crawl from the water, shed their skins for the last time, and become shining aerial wizards. What a beautiful illustration. In the depths of the summer pond, here hang the algae, green and small, in the depths of the summer pond. Here floats the flea, waving antenna, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. Here nods the nymph with feathery gills that drinks the flea, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. Here dives the bug, sleek and swift, that nabs the nymph, that drinks the flea, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. Here kicks the frog with golden eyes, that gulps the bug, that naps, nabs the nymph, that drinks the flea, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. Here lurks the fish wide of jaw, that swallows the frog, that gulps the bug, that nabs the nymph, that drinks the flea, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. I can almost hear you reading that with me. Again, the author uses repetition. Here hunts the heron, queen of the pond, that spears the fish, that swallows the frog, that gulps the bug, that nabs the nymph, that drinks the flea, that eats the algae green and small in the depths of the summer pond. Okay, so here gives us some information about the food chain. Life in the pond begins with plants which manufacture food from the sun. Plants become food for plant eating, called herbivores. Animals like the tiny water flea or the water boatman. These small animals and bugs are eaten by bigger bugs, which are eaten by meat-eating carnivores, right? Animals like minnows and tadpoles. Bigger fish eat the smaller fish. And the heron, with its keen eyes and sharp beak, eats whatever it wants. This is the smallest of the flowering plants, about the size of this, oh, which is right there. <laughs> That's really small. <laughs> it floats on top of pond water, letting its roots hang down to absorb the food it needs. It spreads very quickly by growing side shoots, or ears, which breaks off and become new plants. In the warmest days of summer, it can completely cover a small pond, providing shelter for many insects and animals. It is a favorite food of almost every pond dweller, especially the duck. Can you guess what it is? Here's the poem. A small green riddle. 
I float without air, I root without soil, eaten by all, named for one, the color of grass, water carpet, I grow daughters like ears, I am no bigger than a splatter of paint. Soon I will take over the pond. Maybe you've seen them before. Catus fly. When catus fly larvae or catus worms hatch, most species immediately get to work building themselves a protective camouflage case. They glue together whatever they find at the bottom of the pond, leaves, sand, pebbles, to form a long tube around their bodies this tube has an opening for their head and upper legs so they can move about and eat. As they grow, the larvae build onto their tiny homes. Then, when this time is right, they steal the end of their case and begin the two-week transformation into adult caddis flies with wings. Aquatic fashion. <laughs> Smart young caddis worms select only the best to dress themselves. Strong, sticky silk, pinpoint pebbles, snips of leaves, or the tiny world islets of snail shells edged in sand. Who cares if each sleek suit measures less than an inch? First prize gets wings. Here's the fashion. Song of the Water Boatman and Back Swimmer's Refrain. Down through the jolly waters green, I stroke with legs both long and lean, like a streamlined Class A submarine on a sunny summer's morning. Yo ho ho, the pond winds blow, and upside down is the way to go. Of plunging deep, I have no fear. To breathe, I keep some bubbles near. Trapped on my chest is a silver sphere on a sunny summer's morning. Yo ho ho, the pond winds blow, beneath my wings the air I stow. I like to eat the dark green goo that floats about like a veggie stew, mixed for a water boatman true on a sunny summer's morning. Yo ho ho, the pond's winds blow, I'd rather catch wee bestios. Danger lurks in every spot, from beetles, turtles, and their lot. I hide down deep where the sun is not on a sunny summer's morning. Yo ho ho. The pond winds blow. I hang up top by the surface glow. I guess by now it's clear to see the boatman's life is the life for me. Among the weeds I'll always be on a sunny summer's morning. Yo ho ho, the pond winds blow. The back swimmer's life is the life I know. Okay, here's some information. Water boatman back swimmer. Common in most ponds, these two half inch long water bugs look almost identical. Both have boat-shaped bodies and oar-like legs. But whereas the water boatman swims right side up, the back swimmer spends its life on its back. You can often see the back swimmer hanging belly side up just below the surface of the water. It is waiting for small insects to eat while the water boatman eats mainly plant matter. Both water bugs carry bubbles of air with them to breathe, either on their bellies primarily the water boatman, or under their wings, primarily the back swimmer. Water bear. The water bear's Latin name, Tardigrata, means slow stepper. This tiny animal, less than a 40th of an inch long, moves among moist mosses and lichens with a slow bear-like gait. When the mosses dry up in hot weather, water bears are marooned with the ability to move or eat, but instead of dying, they shrivel into barrel-shaped microscopic tons, which are easily blown about by the wind. 
In this state, they can live for months, years, even decades. When they tumble back into water, they swell up again and resume their slow water bear lives. The water bear shown here is magnified many times in a drop of water along with other microorganisms. The poem's called Travel Time. In late summer, when the old hot sun drains the pond and every drop of water sizzles and bakes, the water bear stops her lumbering, folds her tiny claws against her chest and shrinks, shrinks smaller than she already is. A speck, a grain, a microscopic tumbleweed. She waits for wind to take her somewhere cooler, wetter, more like spring. Pay close attention to how the words are written in this poem. It changes the way you breathe. It changes the way you, you speak. It's called sentence fluency. Notice how I read that. I said, in late summer, when the old hot sun drains the pond and every drop of water. See how I read that differently? changes the way you understand and the author gets the point across. The Seasons Campaign. One, spring. We burst forth crisp green squads, bristling with spears. We encircle the pond. Two, summer. Brown velvet plumes bob jauntily. On command, our slim waving arrows rush toward the sun. Three, fall. All red-winged generals desert us. Courage clumps and fluffs like bursting pillows. Four, winter. Our feet are full of ice. Brown bones rattle in the wind. Sleeping, we dream of seed scouts sent on ahead. Here's some information about cattails. Cattails are plants called emergence, for they grow half and half out, half in and half out of the water. Their tall, spiky leaves spread around the edges of ponds and shelter many animals. Red-winged blackbirds nest in them, muskrats build mounds with their leaves, and ducks paddle among them, hidden from predators. The most distinctive part of the cattail is its brown flower, which looks like a sausage on a stick. Soft as a cat cat's tail, this flower becomes a fluffy mass of parachuting seeds spreading with the wind. When tiny cattail seeds fall on moist soil, they sprout and grow new cattails. Into the mud. Painted turtles. Like other reptiles, painted turtles are ectothermic or cold-blooded. This means they cannot make their own heat as we do. They depend on the surrounding temperature to warm their bodies. In the fall, when the weather gets cool, there is no long, longer enough sunlight for them to remain active. Although with many other creatures, they burrow into the pond's muddy bottom to hibernate. Their heartbeat slows and their breathing stops. Though ice may form above them, they are protected from freezing by a layer of mud. Okay, so this one's called Into the Mud. Sun slants low, chills, chill seeps into black water. No more days of bugs and basking last breath, last sight of light and down I go into the mud. Every year here I sink and settle, shuddered like a Shed inside my eyes close, my heart slows to its winter wither, rhythm. Goodbye, goodbye, remember the warmth, remember the quickness, remember me, remember. Okay, so we're going to 
there's how the book ends. We're going to have a little discussion here about some of the poems. So the book begins with a poem about spring. Listen to me, correct? So it begins with a poem about spring and then it ends with the poem about the turtles into the mud and what season is this late fall correct so why do we think that the author organized the book this way why do you think the author did that I'm gonna go back and read the seasons campaign and tell me what you think. One, spring. We burst forth, crisp green squads bristling with spears. We encircle the pond. Two, summer. Brown velvet plumes jo bob jauntily on command. Our slim waving arrows rush toward the sun. Three, fall. All red wings. Red wing generals desert us. Courage clumps and fluffs like bursting pillows. Four, Winter, our feet are full of ice, brown bones rattled in the wind, sleeping we dream of seed scouts sent on ahead. So the author, if we look at how the author organized the text, not only in this poem, but throughout the book, uh, the author used what we call descriptive structure. She organized it by going by each season, but it's very descriptive just those words alone she uses words that describe the season when she uses says listen to me not only is she describing the animals that are in the in the pond at this time but she's also describing the season she says a wet night a rainy night um, she talks about um, thawing so these are all things that would happen in the spring and if we go out and look back throughout the, the book and we look at the different seasons, she's not only describing the animals, but she's also describing the seasons. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this book. This was very fun to read. Not only were the, the poems fun to read and enjoyable, but it also gave us a lot of interesting background facts and background knowledge for us. Thank you for listening, and I will see you again later. Bye-bye.